This is Paul Burnett interviewing Dr. Alex King for the mining project of the business series. And this is tape two, and um, it is October 13th, 2014. So we last left off talking about the establishment of, um, well, your, your tenure as, at, at, as director of the Ames Lab um, uh, from 2008 to 2013. And then January 1st, 2013, you became director of something like that, very beginning of 2013. Uh, it was actually June 1st. June so 1st, the, so okay. the award was announced very early in January of 2013. And it took about five months to negotiate all the terms. So when you get the phone call, what you hear is, well, congratulations, you've been awarded, you know, you've won the competition, you've been awarded this $120 million and you there's a sharp intake of breath as the reality sinks in and you think, oh dear, <laughs> now we have to deliver. But uh, you, the next day you get a letter mm -hmm. which says, um, congratulations, you have been awarded the right to negotiate for, <laughs> and so then there's a period of, of negotiation. But yeah, six months later, June 1st, mm -hmm. um, we formally kicked off and I stepped down from being the director of the Ames Lab mm -hmm. uh, to devote my attention full time to starting up and running the Critical Materials Institute. And you had already begun thinking about it to some degree. We had spent, at, at that point, we had spent a little over two years from starting to build the team and put the structure in place, which of course was part of the proposal. Mm -hmm. um, and when the competition ended in late November of 2012, we sort of went into this stage of hibernation where we're just waiting for the, the outcome. Mm -hmm. But after the announcement on, uh, I think it was January 6th, mm -hmm. um, we went into pretty high gear, putting into place the staff, um, a number of the, the necessary pieces, but we, we hit the ground running on June 1st. Right, right. and you, you mentioned that um, the there was a DOE report in 2011. That's right, and, the and, critical material strategy. Right, yeah. and I imagine Ames was, the Ames lab was involved in that. Actually, not nearly as much as we would have liked to have been, hmm. but it turns out that's a good thing because by not being part of it, um, we had some plausible deniability. You know, it didn't look as though we designed the whole thing. Right. Um, and you know, the folks at DOE headquarters did a good job. Mm -hmm. They wrote a strategy. You know, I might have changed a few dots and commas here and there through the document, mm -hmm. but the broad strokes of the strategy are very good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's uh, DOE suggests a, a strategy in three pillars. Um, the three pillars being source diversification. That is, if you can't get enough from the one place that supplies anything find more places to get it from. Um, the second pillar, which is almost counter to the first, is find alternative materials. If you can't get enough of material A, find material B that does the same thing. Um, and the third pillar of the strategy was just make do with what you have by being more careful about how you use it, meaning waste less during manufacturing, recycle what you waste, and recover at the end of life and recycle end of life products. Um, so those are the three main pillars of the strategy. And you know, not being entirely dumb, we've, we wrote our proposal to mirror what DOE had already said it wanted to do. So we have um, a, a structure of our research programs within CMI. Focus area one is called source diversification. Um, so, uh, uh, focus area number two is called material substitution. Focus area number three deals with um, uh, resource, renewal, efficiency. renewables, efficiency, right. recycling, all those things. But we added a fourth focus area which has the task of serving the other three focus areas, 
with basic science, um, knowledge that is needed for the more technical aspects of the first three. So we regard focus area one, two, and three as being highly technical, highly linked to industry, um, building things that industry wants. But focus area four is linked in the same way to focus areas one, two, and three, providing the underlying science, thermodynamic data, phase diagrams. Um, also environmental science to go with the things we're working on. So whenever we come up with a new process, we check carefully to see if it produces any environmental toxins. Mm -hmm. um, and the th there's another part in focus area four, which is uh, something I, I particularly like and I'm proud that we included, and that is an economic analysis uh, component where we are looking at supply chains, we're looking at models for predicting what materials may become critical in the future. Uh, we're looking at how we can better understand the existing supply chains, um, how we can collect data more efficiently to know where materials are being used and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and how we can look at life cycle analysis within all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm assuming that the Ames Laboratory did not have a, a high number of economists? I think you could say that we had zero. <laughs> okay. and you wouldn't get any dispute on that. Okay. So um, we, in, in part of building the team for this, um, we found that the Colorado School of Mines has you know, as you'd expect in a school of mines, they had a very good mining uh, program, but they also had a very good mineral economics program mm. headed up by Rod Eggert. Um, and um, as we developed the, our research projects and we built our proposal, one of the, the tests that we put everything again up against was you know, does this make economic sense? Is there a demand for it in industry? Uh, if we succeed with it, will it have a significant impact on the total availability of rare earths? You know, is, or is this a project that will solve a problem that has microgram impact in a you know, a kiloton <laughs> kind of market? Right. Um, so the economic analysis and economic thought processes more almost you know we don't I wouldn't claim that I've become a great economic analyst out of this but I've learned an awful lot from talking to the economists about ways to think about how much impact you're really having mm -hmm. so in the end Rod became the deputy director of the Critical Materials Institute so I'm the director because I suppose People think that I have a lot of administrative and leadership experience. Um, there is no such thing as enough administrative and leadership experience for these things. But I have a certain amount of technical experience in totally unrelated areas. Um, and Rod brings in the economics. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And Karl Geschneidner um, serves as the chief scientific officer for the, for the whole operation. Wow. It's, it's a really good team. Yeah. I'm really proud of the team. Yeah, actually. and you um, and you got put on to the Colorado School of Mines. Was it the suggestion of, of someone? That no, it was one of these things where um, there were various efforts to put together reports on critical materials, and the American Physical Society and the Materials Research Society both have public affairs programs and they, they joined forces and they said, well, let's do a, um, a report on critical materials. And actually, Rod Eggert was one of the members of that study, as was I and as was Carl Gischneidner. And, you know, I, th I think it was walking along 15th Street in Washington, D.C. one night between a committee meeting and trying to find dinner. Um, we sort of persuaded each other that, you know, if we joined forces, Colorado School of Mines and Ames Lab would be pretty much unbeatable as mm -hmm. the proposal was being developed. 
It sounds like it's... And then we had to convince the rest of the world, of course. But <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, well, mineral economics at, at Colorado School of Mines is highly specialized, and their, their analysis of, uh, you know, doing, doing all of the cost accounting for exploration and, and how to, <laughs> yep. how to, how to you know, take a, a, an operation that takes 15 years before it's profitable. That's right. a very particular kind of economic knowledge, and one yeah. would think that would be extremely germane to the... Right, exactly. The stuff that you're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so um, perhaps we could take each domain mm -hmm. uh, one at a time. Okay. And talk about how, uh, how you set it up and what kind of surprises have come along the way. Because <laughs> I right. imagine there are some. Uh, yeah, uh, and, one or two. And, and, how, and, and how things stand now in yeah. each, each of those domains. So starting with source diversification, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, uh, and that one's perhaps the most complicated yeah. and difficult to explain. So our basic approach there has been, we're not allowed to use our funds to, um, uh, to support any single mine, miner, corporation or whatever. We're supposed to be developing technologies that enable any miner to operate. And by virtue of developing technologies that make it more economical to operate a mine or some other way of getting these materials, um, then we, we make it possible for those people to get enough financing in, on their own. So that's the whole, the whole idea is just generate technologies, let the market use them as they see fit. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few very specific areas of research. One is, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, this problem of separating rare earths where you have to have 400 mixer settler stages to, to separate just the ones you want from a rare earth mine. Um, and anything that can be done to improve the separations process is really important. But it, it pays off big because if you increase the enrichment ratio, so I told you um, you have rare earths in, dissolved in acid, you mix it up with some organic and you hope some of the rare earths dissolve in the organic. Mm -hmm. um, if you can change the enrichment ratio by a small amount, then the number of stages of enrichment that you need to reach a certain concentration goes down exponentially. Not, it's not linear. So if you, if you um, double the enrichment factor, then you get a factor of 10 improvement in the number of stages you need. Wow. So yeah, it's significant. So we've been working pretty hard on trying to find new chemical bonding agents that improve separation ratios. And we have some extremely promising results. Good. We have, in one case, demonstrated a factor of two improvement in enrichment factor in the traditional uh, mixer settler type of enrichment. So that if that works across the board, that means you go from 400 mixer settler stages to 40. That means that the capital investment to build a separations plant goes down by a factor of 10. Right. That should help a lot of miners. That's not an incremental change. But we think that's <laughs> fairly revolutionary, yes. Um, so that, that addresses traditional mining. Another one that we're looking at is, uh, that actually uses the same underlying basic science is the question of froth flotation, which is, you know, this really, I mean, basic. And old. Old <laughs> technology, yeah. You know, you, you grind up rock, you throw it in a vat of water, and you blow bubbles through it, and you hope the bubbles stick to either the, um, the valuable rock or the, the non-valuable. And one floats to the top, and the other sinks to the bottom. Well, it turns out that in rare earth mines, the efficiency of that process is only about 65%. So that means you collect 65% of the bastnosite ore that contains rare earths. And um, the remaining 35% ends up in the tailings heap. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can improve on that 65% um, to say 
you know, we're not even thinking about going to 100. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can get to 75%, that means you've improved the yield of the mine by you know, a sixth. Right. That's huge. Right. Um, so it'd be another major step forward. And what it amounts to is you have to find chemical bonding agents that stick to the, um, the basnesite ore that you want to collect and also stick to air bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, and it's designing chemical ligands, bonding agents, that do those things. Mm -hmm. um, so those are two approaches to traditional mining. We're also looking at non-traditional sources. So in the chemical fertilizer business, which is the largest tonnage material producer of anything on this planet, um, they produce, you know, I think, 900 million tons of fertilizer every year and just throw it on the ground. Um, well, it's not just throw it on the ground, but that's basically what happens. But in that 900 million tons, there exists as much rare earth as we currently use, or we, is currently produced from rare earth mining. It, but it just flows through the process and it is included with the fertilizer at very low concentration. We are looking at ways to intervene in the fertilizer production process and extract rare earths, return the, the process flow to the fertilizer manufacturers um, at the same rate and temperature mm -hmm. and acidity right. as we got it from them. And they can go ahead and make fertilizer, but we've just sucked the rare earths out of the stuff before they get to it. Um, and that's showing some promise. Mm. The other thing that we're doing in this area is kind of um, not intuitive. Um, and that is that we are looking for new uses for some of the rare earths. The reason for this is that when you mine for rare earths, you get all of the rare earths mm -hmm. from cerium to lutetium in varying quantities. Mostly you get the light rare earths because nature produces light elements more than it produces heavy elements. Um, Is that because they're so similar it's chemically? Yeah, it's, for the, so it's exactly the same thing as, you know, we find it hard to separate the rare earths. Well, so does nature. Right. So it puts them all in the same place. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not that we're dumb that it's hard for us to separate rare earths. Nature can't do it either. So there they all are. And when you start separating them, you get lots and lots of cerium mm -hmm. and lots and lots of lanthanum. Mm -hmm. And in fact, more than 50% of a mine's production might be cerium. Uh, and certainly cerium plus lanthanum might be more than 50%. Then you get down to the neodymium, which is stuff you can really sell. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing is looking for new uses for cerium in particular, mm. which is overproduced. We, we, we refer to materials that you have too much of right. or that you really want to get rid of as anacritical. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not shortage materials, but if you could get rid of them, that would be really good, especially if you could sell them. Right. So we're looking at a number of ways of using up cerium um, in other areas. Um, there are some things that you can do with cerium in terms of alloying of other metals. Um, it's used in some glass um, to uh, absorb ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. It's used as an abrasive. Um, it has great potential, currently unrealized, mm. as a catalyst in um, the production of polymers. Mm. Um, so we're looking at a lot of those to see if we can find new uses for cerium because that adds to the value of a mine and that means the mine is therefore economically more viable. Right, right. So not necessarily the most intuitive thing, but uh, we're looking at the anacritical aspects of uh, critical materials too. And that. So that's focus area one. Well, is there uh, just because um, I think I, I misunderstood? Um, uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Now we're going. The second area is substitution. So you're going to talk about that. right okay. substitution. Is, um, so focus area two. You know, focus area one is okay. 
let's find more places to get rare earths back. And focus area two, which is sort of, in a sense, completely at war with focus area one, mm -hmm. although they're, they're really good friends. <laughs> you know, there's no open hostilities. But focus area two is um, intended to completely relieve the world of the need to mine rare earths. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, we're trying to make mining for rare earths cheaper and more efficient. On the other hand, we're trying to make it go away completely. Right. We just develop solutions and let the marketplace decide. Mm -hmm. um, but focus area two is looking specifically at the use of rare earths in two particular um, technologies. One is magnets and the other is lighting. Um, I would say that I am convinced that we will have success in one of those. The one that we will have success in is lighting. Um, fluorescent tubes, you know, when they're turned off, they look white, and that's because there is a white powder coated on the inside of the glass. What that white powder does is it converts um, ultraviolet light which is produced inside the tube into visible light, which you can see, and which lights us up even here today. Mm -hmm. um, the phosphor is made of some fa fairly complex um, oxide compounds, which include um, europium, which produces red light, and terbium, which produces green light and blue comes along almost free for the ride. Um, but with red, green, and blue, you get what's called a tri-band phosphor. And the lights that we're sitting under today actually produce red, green, and blue light in a carefully balanced mixture that, that is either a warm white or a cool white light. Um, but the terbium and the europium being heavy rare earths are among the rarest of the rare earths. Uh, so the hunt is on for a phosphor that can produce red and green without using europium and terbium. Um, and this is a big challenge. Um, it was a major, major breakthrough in the 1960s when the red light production from europium was discovered and um, the first generation of color TVs, which had terrible color rendition, gave way to um, you know, the, the second, uh, what lasted throughout all cathode ray tubes until they went away and were replaced by flat panels, um, they all contained europium. Mm. Uh, and that's what Mountain Pass was for, uh, for the uh, most part. Originally, yeah, it was, um, well, depending on who you talk to, yeah, it was for europium for TV tubes, or it was for a, something called mish metal, which is a mixture of praseodymium and neodymium, which was used in lighter flints because mm. People used to smoke more in those days. Um, <laughs> so, um, and a lot of its production went into lighter flint. But we are investigating a number of substitute materials for europium and terbium in phosphor applications, particularly for fluorescent lights. And we are getting very close to solutions mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, an industrial partner, you know, GE makes fluorescent lights. They're working very hard with us to test all of the solutions that we come up with. Um, you know, the only thing that can stop us is if LEDs take over from fluorescence before you get the job done. <laughs> but. Um, well, so far, fluorescents have it in terms of being a bit more appealing as a light source. Uh, no? That's arguable okay. right now. I mean, the LEDs over the last year or so have improved radically in their color rendition, in the light production. You know, I have some LED lamps in my kitchen. They're frankly a little bit dull. But the, um, the ones you can buy today are much better. And the prices have dropped precipitately. So um, people will still make fluorescent tubes to replace the ones that are currently installed. Yeah. New installations, I think, are going to shift over to LEDs. Originally, when we started this, we asked the lighting manufacturers when they thought that, because it was clear it was going to happen. We asked when they thought it would happen. They said, and this was just 
a, a year and a half ago. They said, that'll be 15 years at least. Wow. And um, I checked back in with them a few months ago. They said, well, it could be next year. So one of the things you have to deal with is change. Mm -hmm. Your technological change happens really fast. And it happens in a series of tipping points. Mm -hmm. It's not a smooth progression. Okay. So you, you, we have to be agile like yeah. that. But we're very, I, I think we're, we're coming close to some phosphors that will really work. Mm. On magnets, things are a little bit more difficult. I mean, the neodymium ion boron magnet is um, really a tough act to beat. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, it was invented in response to the cobalt crisis of 1978. The best mm -hmm. magnets in the world in 1978 were samarium cobalt. And everybody was worried about samarium because it's a rare earth metal. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it was cobalt that went into short supply because of um, political instability in Zaire. In response to that, um, in two labs independently, one in Japan, one at General Motors, General Motors Research Lab, um, people looked at samarium cobalt and they said, well, Samarium's a rare earth, cobalt is a, a magnetic transition metal. Why don't we look at other mixtures of rare earths and transition metals and see if they perform? So they, among other things, looked at iron and neodymium, mm -hmm. which turned out to be a winning combination. Then somebody added boron, and there are various legends about whether that was by accident or whether it was deliberate to try and make this stuff more processable. But the boron addition was the icing on the cake. So you have uh, a formula of 2141, two atoms of neodymium, 14 atoms of iron, one atom of boron, mm -hmm. is the strongest magnet that you can get per unit weight mm -hmm. in the world today. And it's very tough to, to follow because what it does, it's really a, an iron magnet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most it's of the atoms dope. in it are iron. Right. But the, dope, the, the neodymium has the, this bizarre effect that nobody really understands yet. Mm -hmm. But it makes all of the magnetic moments of all the iron atoms line up. Mm -hmm. And it's like the iron is really, really well behaved when there's neodymium there. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, mom and dad are in town. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Shape up, you know, clean up the bedroom. Um, but the, all the iron atoms are, are perfectly aligned. So you've got the best iron magnet you can possibly get. And th there's not much you can do to get beyond that. But there's one thing that's really important. The, um, the behavior of the neodymium iron magnet declines as temperature goes up. Mm. And it declines quite badly, actually. So people add dysprosium to it, which is another rare earth, a heavy rare earth. It's about 10 times the price of neodymium. And the dysprosium is put in, and that helps the magnet to retain its strength as temperature rises. Magnets in power types of operations, so where you're converting power to electricity or electricity to power, so big motors or big generators, they get hot. And um, you know, the, the mechanical engineers try and constrain the temperature increase. And in fact, they're limited to about 200 degrees Celsius. Not by anything very special. It's when that's where the insulation melts on the, the wires. Mm -hmm. So um, okay, 200 Celsius is what they designed to. And Dysprosium is put into neodymium ion boron to get its performance acceptable at 200 Celsius. Mm -hmm. uh, dysprosium is very, very expensive. Uh, if you've got enough neodymium, you may not have enough dysprosium. So one of the things we're working on is reducing the amount of dysprosium that's needed in a magnet. And there's a lot of very clever approaches to that. So that's one of our areas of interest. And that involves a lot of very basic physics, actually. Okay. Um, so that's served partly by our fourth focus area. Mm -hmm. We have one kind of, um, I'd say, the Hail Mary pro project, in a sense, on all this, is um, 
we are actually looking at trying to develop uh, an alternative material, completely different material. And it's going back to samarium cobalt, which is still widely used, but trying to make a samarium cobalt perform at the level that neodymium ion boron performs. And you can do that by using an idea called a, a spring magnet, where you actually have to mix um, layer, very fine layers or fine, uh, fi very fine scale mixtures of a hard ferromagnet with a soft ferromagnet. It turns out that this has a, a, um, a particular ability to enhance the magnetic field of the hard magnet. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble with it is that it has to be done at the level of a few layers of atoms. So you need samarium cobalt and a soft magnetic phase layered one on top of the other in very, very fine scale. And getting it to that very fine scale is what's challenging. Mm. Um, so we're actually, we've been successful in making uh, nanometer scale samarium cobalt. Mm. We've been successful in coating it. Now we've got to be successful in joining it, sintering it together into a magnet. Wow. So, so the scaling up is the next Scaling, phase. yeah. Anything you do with nanotechnology, you know, it's easy to make nano stuff it's not so easy to make it at tonnage scales, <laughs> which is what you really need. Right, right. Yeah. So you're, t you're looking at uh, finding different combinations of elements that can be used to make magnets mm -hmm. that, that are as strong or even stronger, perhaps, yeah. uh, as, as the elements that are favored right now. Right. Um, and ne neodymium magnets are used. And when, these, when people say neodymium magnets, they're basically talking about iron magnets that have a tiny bit of neodymium. Well, it's not so, uh, yeah, it's, it's not that tiny. I mean, if you count the atoms, the neodymium atoms are definitely a minority. Mm -hmm. But neodymium's a fairly heavy atom, so mm -hmm. weight-wise, um, I forget, I haven't done the math for a while, but uh, it's about six, the neodymium's about 60% of the mass of the magnet. Okay. So, oh, you know, right. uh, okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I read that the neodymium in, in some of the large wind turbines, the neodymium magnet assembly weighs a ton, literally yeah, a ton. Yeah, that's right. Oh, so, that's... Um, so it's um, the, the rule of thumb is um, 500 kilograms of magnet per megawatt of power. Mm. So today's wind turbines, land-based wind turbines, are uh, about two to two and a half megawatts. Mm -hmm. So about a ton of magnet, if you used a magnet. The, the, the problem is that because that is so much neodymium, mm -hmm. um, that most manufacturers don't do that. They would prefer to put in a lower powered magnet and increase the uh, voltage by just increasing the speed of rotation mm -hmm. by using a gearbox. Gearboxes, unfortunately, are prone to failure. Right. As you, you, you showed us a slide in your presentation of, of a gearbox exploding, <laughs> yeah. catching fire. Right. Uh, and this is a failure. And it's like 33,000 wind turbines in the United States, and only 233 have neodymium yep. uh, magnets in them. Right. So this is obviously, you know, if you can get the cost down, the, the applications can increase, and you can get wide adoption of right. new emerging technologies that are fuel efficient and um, uh, can give us a different kind of energy mix. There are all these downstream consequences yeah. of these kinds of substitutions that you're talking about. Right. And you know, the next wave of wind energy is going to be larger wind turbines. Um, so Siemens has announced a six megawatt wind turbine. Um, and it's going to be offshore. Yeah. So you really, really want a high reliability wind turbine when you go offshore. Mm -hmm. You do not want to be going out there in a boat or a helicopter. Um, and you do not want to be having to lift you know, a three-ton magnet up to the top of a 300-meter tower um, in a gale. <laughs> it does, it just... Right. And the gale would tend to accompany uh, the areas where wind is. <laughs> wind, wind well, that, you know, you put wind turbines where the wind blows. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those catches that you just can't work around, unfortunately. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there, there are substitutions in magnets. 
for substitutions in, um, in lighting. And there was a decision because those are the two most economically and environmentally um, promising areas, or were there other areas that were on the table at some point? It's because they are f for the respective materials. For magnets, neodymium and dysprosium, magnets are the biggest single use of that material. Mm -hmm. So that's the place where you can have, economically speaking, the biggest impact. Um, for europium and terbium, lighting is by far the biggest use of those materials. There are other uses, but um, you know, why would you start to develop a recipe for breadcrumbs if you were making loaves, you right, know? Right. So, um, so. Um, and so uh, the third area is um, a very, in a very broad category, is, is efficiency of production and, and efficiency of, of supply, so, so mm -hmm. also recycling as well. Can you talk about the efforts? These are trickier areas, I understand. They are very tricky. So um, what we're talking about here is it, um, the, bet, the best possible use of available supplies, and that means wasting less through um, manufacturing efficiency. Um, when you make magnets and you know, you're sitting there with the headphones on, you've got at least two neodymium iron boron magnets up close to your ears driving the, the loudspeakers. Um, if you've got an iPhone, you've probably got five or seven neodymium magnets and microphones and, uh, and loudspeakers in the phone. Um, when you make those tiny, tiny magnets, what you generally do is you make big magnets and then cut them down into little magnets. And when you cut anything, you produce sawdust, uh, or what's called swarf, technically. Um, so there can be as much as 50% waste in making some of these things. And we're looking at ways to cut down the waste by either not machining Magnets not cutting them down, but making them at the scale that they are wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not going to happen for the very, very small ones. But we're looking at um, additive manufacturing of magnets as a way forward. And additive manufacturing, you know, big hot topic these days, right. lots of fun. Um, so we're looking at additive manufacturing, which has some interesting advantages. Generally, you can't make as strong a magnet that way. Mm but you can make it in the shape that you want it. Mm. And that can compensate. So um, that's one approach. Um, and that would be essentially 3D printing as yeah. in the sort of right. popular parlance. That's, yeah, that's what we're exactly. talking about. And you, could make, you can make magnets using 3D printing technology. Yeah. Already demonstrated that that's possible. Um, in an, in another project, we have found that most commercial magnets are not fully optimized. So um, we've taken magnets out of existing devices, and we have a, a little process of our own where we can actually push up the magnetic properties so that um, you know, the magnet gets stronger or uh, better properties of one kind or another. And we've shown that this is fairly consistent. Um, and we believe that if we can use that technology, we can make magnets stronger. And if you can make them stronger, then you need only have a smaller magnet. Mm -hmm. So that's another efficiency. Um, so these are on the, on the man manufacturing side. Um, on the recycling side, we'll, we've we're looking at what you can do with um, the sawdust that comes when you do cut mm -hmm. magnets. And actually, most manufacturers are already recycling that as much as they can. Mm -hmm. We think there may be a few tricks let yet to, um, to play out in that. Mm -hmm. um, but the big one, I think, is um, post-use recycling. And uh, there are lots and lots of challenges there. Yeah. So the average... You know, we talk about neodymium ion boron magnets. They're actually not just a, a chunk of neodymium ion boron that's been magnetized. Um, 
in most cases the magnets that are used in electronics, so the, um, the loudspeaker, the microphone, the, um, the motor magnets in your hard disk drive are what's called laminated magnets. So they make thin sheets of magnetic material, layer them up with layers of glue and stick, you know, s stick them together. So you've got lots of layers of glue in there. And then because neodymium and iron are prone to corrosion, you have to protect them from the environment. So they're coated either in paint or in nickel or in a layer of copper and then a layer of nickel. So if you want to capture that magnet and recycle it, you have to find ways to dissolve the magnet material, which is sort of basic, we know how to do that sort of, but you've also got to find ways to get around the, the nickel layer that's typically on the surface of the paint and all the glue, which can be, depending on the manufacturer, almost anything. Hmm. Um, so there's some interesting challenges in how we do that. And we've got a number of techniques um, for uh, dissolving a magnet in whole or just certain components of magnets, depending on what the desired outcome is. Mm. A few techniques in that regard. But the, the big challenge, frankly, you know, the, those are chemistry. And, you know, I, I, I really annoy my chemist friends when I say, that's just chemistry. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. Because it's not. It's not, you know. But I love to say it just because just cause you get the reaction. Um, but the, um, the really big challenges are collecting enough of whatever you, you want, you know, whether it's small motors from, you know, uh, products like hair dryers and hand drills or air conditioning units, small appliances around the home. The biggest single use is hard disk drives in computers, um, but just collecting enough of those is by far the biggest economic barrier. Mm. Um, you know, you have to drive a truck from door to door. You know, if people actually put them out for recycling, which they don't. Um, you know, putting them out, dry, driving a truck uh, around a neighborhood to pick up maybe two hard disk drives a day mm -hmm. is not economical. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got them, disassembling a hard disk drive is really hard. Have you ever tried to take one apart? <laughs> it's In a moment of rage. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we've all had that, but actually, what we've what we've come up with is is sort of therapeutic to some extent. Um, when people first started looking at hard disk drives and getting the magnets out of them, they talked about you know giving retired people screwdrivers and undoing the whole this and and then the Japanese came along with a machine that basically tumbles hard disk drives in a in what looks like a tumbler dryer. Um, makes an awful lot of noise, mm. but it shakes the screws loose and then the case comes apart. Mm. Um, and then we, then they came up with this idea that that's all a waste of time. What you really want to do is just take a big punch. If you know where the magnet is, it's usually in one corner of the, one of the four corners of the disk drive. You take a punch that's big enough, circular, and just punch it through, mm -hmm. and you punch out the magnet. And then you throw away the rest of the disk drive, um, and that's kind of therapeutic. And then we said, you know. Why make a circular cut? Why not just make a straight cut right across the corner? And so actually, the way things are moving now is simplify the, the process. Mm. So get away from having any machines that you know, you know specialized. Just take this to a, a, a shear. You, know, you can actually put this on a foot-operated metal shear. Put your hard disk drive on the shear, line it up and you just stamp down with your foot and the corner just falls off. Um, so trying to get these things simplified to the extent possible uh, so that disassembly is no longer as costly as it was, but still collection of you know, a, a wide diversity of different devices is really, really hard to it, do. It's true. Um, there's a, a number of um, authors who have looked at um, uh, the kind of 
um, disassembly lines in China, where you yep. have uh, whole villages that are dedicated to one by one removing all the platinum, all right. the, and it's and extremely they, they, they get all the toxins too. And of they, course, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so finding some way. I mean, this this seems to be uh, an area where the laboratory can contribute a great deal at the point of interaction with the device, but getting mm -hmm. the devices there, you're, it's part of a larger cultural and social system right. that has to be built, essentially. Right. And um, a lot of it is uh, sociology in, in some sense or some level. Um, so I, I'm just back from Japan, um, where recycling is much more in people's mindsets. You know, they, they, do not fill their trash cans with all the garbage. They separate and recycle, and um, you know, electronics recycling is the the accepted behavior mm -hmm. in Japan. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in the U.S., the attitude is, yeah, I guess we've got landfills. You know, what's what's the problem with those? Um, you know, landfills are not the best place to put these things. So one of the things we're doing is. Um, looking, instead of trying to collect hard disk drives, going to where the hard disk drives are, which is um, data centers. Mm -hmm. um, the average data center, you know, the, what we refer to as the cloud, is actually a brick and mortar. Yeah. You know? It's a place. It's a place. Mm -hmm. And they buy and discard of order two or 300,000 hard disk drives per year. That solves the you know, the collection problem right. to right. some extent. Um, what we're still trying to work around is the fact that data centers shred hard disk drives to protect data. Mm -hmm. And once you've shredded it, all the pieces of the magnet just stick to whatever metal is around and uh, mm -hmm. they're hard to recover. So we, you know, we have a ways to go on that. But there's one bright spot. There's always a bright spot somewhere <laughs> out there. We're also looking at recycling lamp phosphor so we talked about replacing lamp phosphor with other materials. Mm -hmm. um, fluorescent lamps are collected for recycling by law in this country because they contain mercury. Mm -hmm. And um, we try and keep the mercury out of the environment. There is no financial advantage to recycling the mercury. In fact, the recyclers get paid um, by it's effectively a fee levied on the manufacturer or the seller of the lamp, mm -hmm. depending on which state it's in. Um, and they go around and collect lamps and uh, extract the mercury from them. We're trying to get to the point where we can you piggyback on that process to also collect the lamp phosphor from the inside of the glass and recycle for the europium and terbium and yttrium mm. in there. Mm -hmm. And that's looking fairly attractive, actually. Mm -hmm. um, working with some downstream recyclers uh, on that. Again, the, the, the problem is still collection. Although it's required by law that you recycle your fluorescent lamps, most people throw them in the garbage. Right. Um, you know, you're supposed to be able to take them back to a hardware store. There's supposed to be a collection box for them. Uh, I challenge you to find that in any <laughs> hardware right. store in the US. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I'm, I'm wondering, we can, we can go back to this, I suppose, but I, I know that you have a mandate to do research and, and you have to be bounded and limited. Yeah. But uh, let's take, for example, the case of the data centers where, mm -hmm. um, and you're a shear. So you know you have an old industrial device, a, a, mm -hmm. a, a machine tool that just does this job with your foot. Yep. Um, you know, it could be as simple as, as making a report saying if you could require this of data centers and offer some kind of tax break to do so, mm -hmm. put one of those in there and have somebody do that. For yeah, their... I, I, that's okay. Um, but in an ideal world, we would like to be able to do this in a process that actually generates revenue for all parties involved. Mm -hmm. So the data center gets a few pennies per hard disk drive 
um, they get assured that the data is being destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the recyclers can take the material from the hard disk drives, refine it, purify it, do whatever is needed to turn that back into a, um, a usable material. Mm -hmm and they can make money selling that material. Yeah. If you can get the economics of the process to that point, then you don't need taxes, right, you don't need right. subsidies, you don't need legislation. Yeah. And in the current climate in this country, um, it's hard to get you know, Congress to do anything but name a post office. Um, you know, waiting for legislation, it, it, you know, is not really an attractive option. Right. But let's do something that makes it cost effective without waiting for legislation. Right. That's kind of where we're headed with it. So the Japanese solution of urban mining mm -hmm. is something you'd, you'd like to develop in countries like, such as the United States, but yeah. in a way that has the proper market incentives for, right. for different agents. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So every, everybody can see a profit from it instead of seeing it as a cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 